Super quick computers and advanced mathematic formulas have largely taken over trading on the financial markets from human beings. Algorithms which seem to have a life of their own. Algorithms secretly lie waiting for the moment that your Apple share or your pension money gets on the market. The only ones who understand this system in any way are its architects, the algorithm developers. Haim Bodek is one such algo developer. After finding some strange wrongdoings, he sets out on a personal crusade against this elusive system. It's a step that goes directly against the unwritten Wall Street code of silence and secrecy. This is what's in store for you. you know, there's kind of a rule, never blame other people, never blame the market, never blame the other trader. It's always you. Your code, your your code is wrong. If you're on Wall Street, you just assume you're being ripped off unless you're the one doing the ripping off. You know, on Wall Street, you know, we talked about the culture of secrecy. You just don't go to the SEC. This is Backlight. Welcome to the twisted nooks and crannies of our financial markets. This is all about just a one cent move in, in the stock. That's all it is. How a single tick, you know, how a price changes, that's when the game is played. And when that one tick happens, the world is divided into winners and losers. The machinery behind our financial markets consisting of mathematical models, data centers, and miles and miles of fiber optic cables, is disguised by technological complexity and secrecy. The builders of this financial system are a new breed of Wall Street employees, quants, mathematicians and physicists who are responsible for a technological revolution. Heim Bodek is a quant he specialized in artificial intelligence and worked for Hull Trading and Goldman Sachs. He knows the system from the inside. He helped build it. One day I got a call that said, hey, you've got to get in touch with this individual. His name is Heim Bodek. He's got some revolutionary information about high frequency trading, which is one of the subjects that we cover at the Battle of Quants. And I said, sure, I'll give him a call and see what's going on. Having Heim Bodek speak was like opening Pandora's box. And he machine gunned his way through the series of slides with information that, frankly, I heard back from people in the audience and said they were astounded. Nobody ever talked about order types until Heim came around. I mean, it wasn't even part of the conversation. And when I you know, heard what Heim was talking about, he's looking at order types that you know, if used properly, guarantee a profit. There were definitely people in the audience that were aware of this and uh, cowering in their seats saying, you know, ho, ho, how to, who is this guy and why would he allow this information to be out and, and potentially ruin our fantastic, you know, opportunity for generating um, revenue in the marketplace. There are qu actually quite a lot of Russians and uh, one guy came up to me and he, you know, he says, you know, I know what you're doing and you know, I'm behind you and if, if you need anybody and you need any help, uh, you know, I've got some friends. <laughs> and I'm like, aren't I, am I at a quant conference? You know, and these are just other people's reactions, right? I'm thinking to myself, look, it's a bunch of geeks who did this. I'm not going, I don't think I'm going against like the mob or something like that. Parts, parts, parts. In 2011, Bodek's own high frequency trading company, Trading Machines, went under. According to Bodek, the reason was a wrong order type or the way in which he told the exchange to execute his order. Well, this isn't the setup I used to have, I'll tell you that much. 
but uh, it'll do. You know, uh, when we launched uh, trading machines, um, we knew which machines we were faster than then. We, we knew specifically which firms we were faster than and specifically which firms were faster than us because we traded against these firms. So you were as fast as the others that were fast? No, no, we, we, were, uh, we were faster. You can take a time frame of one second and it's almost, it looks as if it's a lifetime of trading between these algos that you never even see. It was Bart C. Kellerman who invited Heim Bodek to tell his story at the Battle of the Quants, a recurring event where quants discuss high-frequency trading, amongst other things. When you buy a stock, you buy it at a price, and then for the next person to buy it, they have to pay more. So that margin was the advantage that a lot of these uh, HFT um, organizations could, could take advantage of. Now, it's minuscule in terms of the amounts, but when you do it millions and millions of times, it, it creates tremendous revenue over a period of time. Ten years ago, these swans would write a model, put it out into the market, and basically go to the beach and relax. And they'd come back at the end of the day and they'd, they'd count their money. Bodek wrote an algorithm for trading machines that would generate a guaranteed income, a money machine that weathered the financial meltdown of 2008. But then, from one day to the next, the algorithm stopped working. I started seeing um, behavior on certain exchanges that just was odd. You, you watch this algorithm and it's cannot trade, even though it's moving the price and it's trying to trade. You're like, why can't it trade? Who, you know, no one will trade with it. I'm going back in time and forward saying, what code changed? You know, we have a million lines of code. The pattern I'm seeing is completely inconsistent with every single bug I've ever seen in that area. Uh, there's kind of a rule, never blame other people, never blame the market, never blame the other trader. It's always you. Your code, your, your code is wrong took 12 months, 12 months from that date until it was explained to me, and it was explained to me by a person. That's why I didn't discover, probably why I didn't discover this for so long, as I s sat there trying to figure out what we did wrong. Uh, went to a um, uh, holiday event hosted by that exchange, and I say, I'm sorry, I have a bug. So to who are you talking uh, to? To a business development guy whose job is to encourage volume growth at the exchange. That's his entire job. Uh, he explained to me that my order was being systematically disadvantaged because I was using the wrong order type. So I, I'm not going to actually blame stock market asymmetry for what finally killed us, but I will say it did waste one year of my life chasing something that I could have learned over drinks. What was your first reaction? I was humiliated. I, 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 I was, you know, how could I not know this? Bodek thought he understood the plumbing of our automated financial markets, but founded on the social codes within the high-frequency trading world. Certain traders had found a way to have their orders jump the queue. Bodek started his career with a company that pioneered automated trading. In Chicago, at Hull Trading. We had a very restrict uh, um, process by which we qualified people to work for us. So it was pretty tough to, to get a job at Hull Trading. Blair Hull is a trading legend. A mathematics genius, Hull made his first fortune at the blackjack tables in Las Vegas. 
With that money, he founded Hull Trading. With his quants, he was at the forefront of the automation of financial markets. In 1977, when I first went down to the Pacific Stock Exchange, I realized that all the paper that was on the floor did not need to exist. And I figured a good programmer could automate this whole process within a year or two. My vision for the direction of where things were going uh, was right on. My timing was off by about 30 years. Nobody who joined Whole Trading was looking for that Wall Street job. They were, they were joining because they wanted to be surrounded by really intelligent people and you know, working on amazing problems. And that, it was not seen as a Wall Street job. I mean, we would never have applied to an investment bank. We would never even have entered my, crossed my mind, right? It, you know, I'm more of like the Google world, not the, the Goldman Sachs world, even though I did okay there. Our search for the origins of the technological revolution that has taken place in financial markets over the past few decades leads us to possibly an even greater trading legend, Thomas Pettifee. We have everything here. We have the American flag and nature and... <laughs> so for 50 minutes from New York on a good day, it's... it's it's good. At age 21, Petifi fled communist Hungary. He was one of the first to see the enormous possibilities of automated trading. With his company, Interactive Brokers, his net worth is an estimated $6 billion. He receives us in his office. I have the first handheld uh, iPad type of computer that I made up in 1983 that the people used on the floor. So this was connected to a battery and uh, here you could display options, you know, various strikes and expiration dates and here were the bids and here were the offers and that way our people on the floor could see what our market was. And via these uh, touch sensitive it is a uh, touch screen. points, it's a touch screen, yeah. And we're talking what year? 1983. And what were other people? Other people, well, other people used their minds. <laughs> So did you patent this? Uh... No, I don't believe in patents. I believe that patents make other people disincentivized in coming up with new things. So uh, other people were sort of copying uh, you? Uh, other pe sure, other people always copied me, but that's okay, that, that moves the world forward. You could have a computer on the floor in the early 80s, but you could not have it directly connected to a price feed. I had my computer in the office, and I would go run up the, go up the elevator, get my computer run, come back down, execute trades, and walk around the floor, and then I'd go back upstairs, do a computer run, and come back down. So I couldn't actually have real price feeds coming in. In fact, the first time that we had option quotes on the floor, in order to input the S&P 500 price, we had what we called a human ticker. And that's the person that looked at the screen and put the price up or down to make sure it was the exact same price. These are the rules that the exchanges had to make sure that people did not move ahead with automation. So we devised a way to, to splice into the wire that, was, uh, that the keyboard was connected to, and we, and we put in keystrokes by a computer so we are much quicker without having to use the keyboard, having to have people sitting there using the keyboard. So this Nasdaq official came and, and he saw this and he said, well, you can do that. And I said, why not? He says, well, because look at the rule. It says that all orders have to be input by the keyboard. 
So we decided to build a, a, a overlay or the, over the keyboard that had pistons, rubber fingers that would go up and down and type, right? And uh, the only problem was it was very loud. So it was really typing like <laughs> and, and, and so the next time the, the, the fellow who comes in again and he hears this crazy, crazy noise of <laughs> and the orders flying in and out. And, and he, so he didn't know what to do. And, and he just looked for a while and then he, he went away. And then we never heard of him again. <laughs> In the 90s, the Wall Street establishment realized it's falling behind in the technological revolution. Just before the turn of the century, Blair Hull sells his company, including his employees, to investment bank Goldman Sachs for half a billion dollars. Having Hull being acquired for me was like getting in the back door of Goldman, and we, we kind of joked about it at, at Hull often. Um, we were um, all given personality tests. And the um, personality type I got was basically your mad scientist personality. <laughs> okay. Wait, what is, is there a goal here? We need some more vinegar, mommy. So, maybe it was about a period of nine months where people were concerned that I was, you know, working at a bank. I spent a lot of my uh, life and my childhood uh, surrounded by physicists at physics labs. What did your father say when you went to um, I don't think he was that uh, thrilled about Goldman, actually. People in that world had, you know, uh, were, were, were exceptional. I met, you know, I, I, I just remember these uh, parties, you know, little get-togethers I go to, and, and I'm like eight years old, and I'm... This guy won the Nobel Prize, and this guy won the Nobel Prize. You know, come here, son, shake both their hands. <laughs> These people believed, and keep in mind, some of them created nuclear bombs, right? You know, the, these people believed that science was going to make a better world, and that the way to make a better world was to understand and to create and to discover. And I'd say the people in that world would look at uh, the world of high finance and say, if you're that smart, why would you do that? M making you know, more money than the other guy, is that really what genius is about? The collective brain power of the mathematics and physics geniuses that have chosen to work in finance has led to 70% of trading now being automated and 50 taking place within milliseconds what's called high-frequency trading, or HFT. High-frequency trading has nothing to do with economics. It has everything to do with understanding how networks operate, how they fail, how to make them fail, how to make them fail in your advantage, how to make them fail in your advantage without being detected. Eric Hunsader's company, Nanex, sells financial data. Out of curiosity, he researches abnormal patterns in financial data flows. He knows what's going on in the financial markets to within a millisecond. So Eric, where are you taking us? I'm taking you to the CME facility in Aurora, Illinois. But the CME is downtown Chicago. Downtown Chicago as much as the NYSE is downtown New York. Right, so it's really all about the data centers. It's where the, it's where the machines are. I believe that building up here on the left is the CME's data, yes it is. It looks huge. It is huge. This is where billions of dollars is transacted every day in the futures markets. When you send orders to buy and sell, this is where it ends up. But what are these poles, these huge antennas? This is how they get it to New York fast. So if you were to go climb that tower, and I, I wouldn't advise it, but if you were and you look straight down where the, that dish was pointing and you had a telescope, you would be able to spot the next one. But I thought that they right used glass fiber to do so. Glass fiber cable. This is more direct. So speed of light is all about distance and 
Actually, light travels a little bit faster in the air than it does in fiber. You know, one, one nanosecond faster, one clock cycle faster is all you need to be. It's, you just need to be faster than the other people. This is probably a big thorn in their side, this relay station here. There's a number of things that can cause loss of signal, like the freshness effect or the, or the atmos atmospheric conditions can change or some child's balloon could go up at the wrong time. Bodex company Trading Machines also made money with its ultra-fast trading. If it was really an equal match and I had lost fair and square, fair and square, I would have beaten myself up, I would have nursed my wounds, I would have actually been quite humble about things. I knew through my own self-criticism what I had screwed up and what I hadn't. Heim Bodex HFT company Trading Machines closes down for good in January 2011. I'd heard of Trading Machines, um, but I didn't know anything about Heim. So I thought, okay, you know, I might as well uh, meet him. So we set up a meeting uh, soon after. This was a few months after Trading Machines had basically shut down. It was no coincidence that Bodek started talking to Scott Patterson, a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. Patterson has followed high-frequency trading closely for years. Without knowing about each other, Bodek and Patterson had both been looking into the conflict of interest between the HFT industry and the exchanges for some time. We, we did meet at Starbucks in Midtown Manhattan, and I remember distinctly at one point near the end of our conversation, uh, Haim said something about uh, there being something in the market that's rigged. And he thought that it was in part responsible for what happened to trading machines. But I, I uh, actually had a full organizational chart with every single headcount, one of the top HFTs in my bag and other you know, things that were um, part of my business intelligence. <laughs> and he had done a lot of work on it, but it was very vague. So you gave him this pile of documents? Well, I let him look over my shoulder. I said, you have to tell me what this is, because so many times in my career, I've talked to people who have said they know about something that's, you know, potentially illegal or something rigged somewhere or another but it's just, it, I never really get them to go beyond just to something that's really vague. And I remember the first real interview that I had with him at his house, and we sat down, I think it was around 10.30 in the morning, and proceeded to talk for seven hours straight and didn't eat anything. I think I had a glass of water and, you know, I just sat back and listened to Haim and took notes uh, for so long that my computer ran out of power and I had to start taking notes by hand because it just, it all came out. I'm going to try to explain metaphorically uh, what, I'm going to, it's really a circus. Uh, so I'm going to make it a little bit of a comedy here about what happens. But sadly, this is pretty much the case. We're going to have um, a concert. Hall. Let's say it's Metallica. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like metal music, so Metallica playing at this concert hall. The ticket counter opens at 6 p.m., so I'm going to go and stand in line. But after a while, other people come in after me, and I'm no longer at the end of the line. There are these scalpers. Well, they're in line with me also, OK? I can see them because they're, they're all wearing the same t-shirt. They also have a very, very close relationship with the exchange, you know, with the venue. And what is that relationship? 
Um, maybe one of them has brings a significant amount, uh, you know, of volume to this. And what does that mean? He buys a lot of tickets. He, of course, he sells those tickets to customers here. But you know, one guy brings a lot of volume. Another guy, one of these scalpers, actually owns 10% of the venue. Okay. Um, a third guy. He doesn't have a lot of volume. He's you know, not uh, big on this venue, but he's big on another venue. And he's got a board seat on this, uh, on this, on, in this venue. So there's a very, very close relationship between these scalpers and the venue. Scalping Metallica tickets. When the ticket counter opens, uh, I'm going to uh, equate that to a, the moment when uh, in the stock market, a price can change. And 6 p.m. on the dot, this is what I'm gonna witness. Every single one of these guys is literally going to immediately, in one picosecond, they teleport, okay? They are all here, ahead of me. How did that happen? I asked some of the other people and they say, oh, they're really fast. I'm like, no, they, they teleport. That guy was behind me. How, did, how does he get ahead of me? There really isn't any difference between an order type and being the guy who wears the t-shirt. You just put a little code on your order and you just say, hey, don't treat me badly, please. So how did you get in contact with Heimbode? I met him at Blair Hall's house. He invited me over to have dinner and that's, how, that's when I first met him. So what do you think of him as a person? He's great. He's another, he knows, he understands code, and so we were talking shop within five minutes. When he told you his story, was it something that you also already had noticed in the data feeds that you were getting in? No. There's no way. We don't know who executes on a quote unless, we don't know who's behind each one, whereas he would know who's behind his, for example. And he knows on what exchanges. He would see what, what, well, I should have been the one in the first, I should have been the next one to be filled, but he wasn't. And there's no way to see that. No, once I was told it was so easy to figure out the rest and fill in all the holes. But if you don't actually know that there are scalpers out there who are gonna use special order types to queue jump you and then they're gonna buy all the tickets and then they're gonna sell them back to the guys in the line. If you don't know that that is a significant amount of the trading that occurs on an exchange and if you don't know the mechanisms by which it occurs, it's, uh, you know, you, you believe what you see on the price feed. So who set this up? It's not a business guy who designed these features. Only a few people out there who have the, really have the technical competency to design these features. Le, you know, less than 10. 10? Less than 10, way less. And you know them all? Uh, not, not personally. Uh, well, I know many of them personally. I don't know all of them personally. Um, I'm very familiar with their work. What were the algorithms that you were building at uh, Citadel, and what was their function? I, I can't get into that. <laughs> I'm terrified of Citadel lawyers, so. Dave Lauer was a trader and analyst at top HFT firms Alston and Citadel. He was asked to testify as an expert at a Senate committee hearing about high-frequency trading. Like Bodek, he is one of the few insiders who has come forward with his experiences. So at the top you have high frequency trading and proprietary trading desks in the big banks. That's, that's the main, that, 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 that's the, the party that everyone else is trying to serve or be a part of. Um, underneath them you have the exchanges and the exchanges entire business model now revolves around volume, so the exchanges uh, work hard to court HFT to attract them to their venues and therefore to attract the volume. And the brokers are the ones routing orders to the exchanges and they're making money off commissions 
from their buy sider. So at the, at the bottom is the buy side. The buy side are the pension funds and the mutual funds. Um, they're the investors. They're the ones who are actually there because they think that a company has good prospects or good fundamentals. And so the amount of money that's being made by all these layers, that is what it costs Effectively, to... Effectively, yeah, that's the cost to trade. When a mutual fund or a pension fund is putting a large order in the market, how is that order being called in jargon among traders? Oh, um, it's the dumb money, it's the, uh, it's the, it's the low hanging fruit, it's the, I mean, that's dinner. It's the bread and butter. It's all these algos do is try to detect when that's happening. They, they, it's all about figuring out when the institution is buying and selling. They're just waiting for my pension money yes. to, to hit the... Yeah. And they'll just, they're just going to skim a little bit off the top. Death by a thousand cuts. Uh, you know, you'll just get picked apart as that order gets, travels through the system. You want to be on the other side of that trade. That's where you're going to make money. It's just how it's been for a long time, so I think most people are just used to it and they don't question it. And they probably just assume they're being ripped off. That's sort of, if you're on Wall Street, you just assume you're being ripped off unless you're the one doing the ripping off. The, basically, the people whose money is in, is in the large pension funds and investment accounts, they do not understand what is happening. If they understood that it is their money, that basically the banks are taking from them and report it as profits, then they would do something about it. But the problem is that, that it's too complicated for people to understand. You know, I, I, it was kind of a comedy for me when, when the order type issue erupted. And it was clear how many people did not know that these exchanges offered specialized order type. You're talking about like probably 90% of finance doesn't know how the U.S. stock market works. The, the exchanges were originally owned by the brokers, and they would bring new companies to market in the exchange in the hopes that the brokers would then be able to market those new company shares to their customers and get a fee for doing that marketing. And those companies would grow and they'd be successful and everybody would be happy. What's changed though in, in, in the whole scheme of things is these exchanges have now been taken over to a large extent by investors, private equity companies, um, not necessarily interested in growing small companies and going public, but instead just generating a monthly return. Um, high frequency trading provides a fee for every trade made. So the more successful and more frequently somebody trades, the fees generated from that went back into creating a profitable exchange. These high frequency firms, they thrive on complexity because if, you know, of everyone, they understand it the best. They understand, because that's their business, is to study market structure, to understand inefficiencies in market structure, and exploit those. Exchanges have changed, from places where companies attracted investors, to data centers where wars are waged between algorithms that trade with each other at the speed of light. A hidden world, where, during a sudden implosion, the infamous 2010 flash crash, $862 billion evaporated within minutes on American stock markets. Wow, almost a thousand points. We call this a capitulation. They're gonna probably halt trading. We can't stop the selling. You know, the flash crash was an event for me that it was a defining event. There was no way for me to ignore that. I was on the high frequency trading floor. Things were going pretty normal. I mean, as normal as it can be, the market was down two and a half percent. It was a riots on TV in Greece, and every time they showed the, the, the Greek riots, the market would drop a little. Um, and 
I remember looking up and just like every trading floor, CNBC is on, and I saw that the Dow Jones had dropped another 100 points. I said, okay, whatever, I kept, kept working. Um, a minute later, I look up and it had dropped another 100 points. I, I got up off my desk and I walk over to the futures traders and they're just scrambling all over the place. They don't know what's going on. They had huge amounts of, of orders in the market. Everything's going crazy. Market started dropping another 100 points and the CEO of the firm comes running out onto the floor and he's just screaming, pull everything, pull everything. So they just, they're just hitting it, hitting buttons, turning everything off, everything off. And so we're all sort of huddled around these two screens. And the one screen is, we're looking at the book. So it's the, the futures market. You have a set of people that are willing to buy and a set of people that are willing to sell. This is the market. And as we're watching the screen, the orders, they start, they start drifting, like orders are being canceled. And then they start drifting more. And then they start to go off the screen. And then they were gone. There was nothing. There was no market for, for moments, for seconds. There was no market, and we're all just sitting there, and you're staring into oblivion. You're like, you have no idea what is about to happen. I was thinking that something terrible has just happened. Something indescribably horrible just happened. The market was gone. I picked up my phone and called my trading desk, and I said, what's going on, the guys? And they said, well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what are you doing? Are you widening out your markets? And said, they said, yes, yes, yes. I said, OK, well, that's all we can do. <laughs> Let's wait until it, it stops. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you get an anxious feeling. You, it, it, you're worried. You, you don't know, is the world coming to an end or what's happening, right? Even 9-11 didn't, <laughs> didn't have that kind of impact. Um, so you, you just things started to return to normal and the market recovered and it bounced back and everyone just kept going. And for me, I don't know, it, it just changed me. Looking back on that day, I, I lost faith in capitalism or at least what we had built to be capitalism. Um, and and I, didn't, I didn't trust it anymore. I lost trust. Uh, my friend has a PhD in climate science from Harvard who was working there. There was a PhD in bioinformatics sitting next to me, uh, a semiconductor designer on the other side. Sitting behind me was a master's in math from MIT. And these people are taking their huge brain power and devoting it to making pennies in, in a high frequency trading system. And I, I couldn't really, I couldn't justify that anymore because these, they should have been doing, you know, they should have been curing cancer or global warming. And here they are, they're making a fortune. And were, were we making the markets a better place? Were we increasing efficiency or stability? I mean, that day showed me that we weren't. This is when you know you stop for the day. Because this entire day, we've done all this, right? And this algo has been pretty much max pain, down 200 bucks. It's up, you know, 471 right now. How many contracts? Oh, it is. Ooh. Contract size is kind of deep sauce, but I mean. It, it rebalances. So. No, 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 I'm saying if it's down direction. Yeah, she will. You're dealing with the puts, right? She will, but this option. Pure question, right? Oh, the market's closed. Hey, I just bought this Facebook and now I got an overnight. What an idiot. What a herb. All right, so I'm overnight. 500 contracts. What do you think you were doing? Facebook. 500 contracts. 500 contracts. Dude, I thought it was like 3 o'clock, man.
So uh, essentially, we run a hedge fund out of here. We pretty much manage a, a community of traders. We bootstrapped it from nothing. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, and uh, our head trader is from, uh, from Boston. We decided to come out here and, and uh, try to make a killing for ourselves. This is Brian Weiner. He uh, is a former head trader over at Trading Machines, um, which was uh, pretty much run by this guy right here, Haim Bodek, aka the Algo Arms Dealer. Okay, that's what we call him here. And uh, he educates us on microstructure, and we use it to try to become better traders. What I do is I get a kick out of watching these guys beat up the machines, which they can do, which is fascinating to me given what I've seen in this business. Together with his friends, Peter Zhang rented a loft in downtown Manhattan to start a hedge fund. Recently, they started working with Haim Bodek to develop an algorithm that simulates the gutsy behavior of a day trader. Charlie lives here, which is, this was originally, I think it was supposed to be a study. He's now turned it into a rainforest jungle. And, uh, and he lives pretty well, you know. Obviously, he's got his own fan, he's got his own bathroom, it's cool. Anand, our main trader, he's got the most gigantic room ever. Uh, but this is the master bedroom, though. And um, obviously, there's, there's, there's everything here. Uh, it's a really big room. He pays, obviously, the most rent here. So most of the time, like after, after trading and after being really worn out, we will just kind of crash on the couch. And it's just like, because we're always in each other's faces, you know, this is kind of like where we hang out. It's also where I sleep. This is my blanket right there. Yep. And uh, we should probably clean it up a little bit. Where does Chaim sleep when he's here? Uh, when Haim's, Haim's here, he sleeps right there. And then it goes down, yeah, it sucks, No, no, but, but that, I mean, that's the point. And I, I think... And you, and you guys okay. could be greedy about Deltas. We right? actually reached out to him through Twitter, and uh, we talked to him on the phone, and he seemed like a genius on the phone. And uh, when he came in, the first time, we just said, you should just come over. You know, come see our operation, you're gonna love it. Let's do some business, maybe. And so he comes over, and he walks in just like full speed, in a suit that doesn't even fit him. And I'm like, hi, what's going on, man? And Anand has this list. He's got this list, like, questions to ask Haim Bodek, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, we'll do that. And immediately we notice Haim does this thing. It's called getting Haimed. And he just, he goes on. And he's just the unleashing of the genius, pretty much. He's certainly respected. He's. He's very experienced. He's got a very impressive background. Um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he was a high frequency trader um, and his systems failed. So I think that plays a large part in how he's seen by the industry. You would see things like he's not credible and, and this doesn't happen or this doesn't happen anymore, or, but never facts behind him. After talking to journalist Scott Patterson, who later publishes Bodek's findings in his book, Dark Pools, Bodek decides to go to the American stock market regulator, the SEC. You know, on Wall Street, you know, we talked about the culture of secrecy. You just don't go to the SEC and tell them about the, you know, inside workings of Wall Street and how things really operate. That's just, you're a pariah if you do that. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this thing's gonna go away. Someone just has to open their mouth, it'll go away overnight. It's a few lines of code to comment out the primary alphas. It's all artificial. Bodex's complaint is taken up by stock market regulator SEC. The investigation has been going on now for two years. The SEC will not comment on its progress. The SEC has not taken action, and it's been a couple of years now. Um, and they have certainly shown that the, the inclination to fine exchanges and, and to make sure that um, things are being run as they should be. So um, either there's nothing going on or it's so complex that it's taking them years. Uh, well, th there's no question that the sophistication of the trading firms far outpaces the sophistication of the SEC. Uh, I think that these are very smart people and they can go to the SEC and they can explain why they want an order type 
why it's helpful for the rest of the market and sound very convincing and leave out this other part about how it's going to allow them to, you know, rake up millions in profits every day and guarantee them, uh, you know, provide guaranteed economics. I think the proprietary trading firms are using the rules to their advantage. And the fact that we created some rules uh, that shouldn't have been created, and we created some order types that are now being looked at very seriously by the SEC, I, I don't think you can criticize the high-frequency trading firms who have only played by the rules. Can we really expect the financial regulators to keep pace with the latest technological developments? The flash crash was followed by numerous other computer-driven technical glitches, like the computer problems during the Facebook IPO. The Twitter crash, when people thought the White House had been bombed. Or the time Goldman Sachs may have lost as much as $100 million in 17 minutes' time due to a faulty algorithm. In a world that is enveloped in silence and secrecy, no one seems to comprehend what's going on, let alone control it. The markets and the, the interplay in the industry between all these firms with all these very com complicated and complex technology systems and how they interact um, makes the entire system of exchanges, high frequency, and brokers and the interaction between the technology, it makes it a complex system. And so, for example, the flash crash is the perfect example. There is no cause and effect that you can point to. What caused the flash crash is a nonsense question. It makes no sense in the context of a complex system. And if you were to replay the same sequence of events identically, there's no guarantee that it would cause a flash crash again. That's the nature of complex systems. Is it the correct remark that a lot of insiders don't understand the markets? I don't think anyone understands what's going on. I think it, that's, that's another quality of complex systems. That they're kind of beyond human comprehension um, to a large degree because you don't know, you know, you understand very well what your algorithms are doing and what your technology is doing. But once that starts interacting with all of the other systems out there, it's very hard to know what's going to result from that. So what did your father say when you told him that you would become a whistleblower and that this happened to you? You know, it is more consistent with the value system that I was raised with. He didn't I, uh, say to you, I told you so? Uh, I, I do think that it was consistent with his view on, on how finance operates. <laughs> when, you, when you make the front page of the journal, I guess you're supposed to keep copies. Here on the bottom, uh, for super fast stock traders, a way to jump ahead in line. Look, oh, one thing about the, the, the culture in Wall Street is, is it is, I don't think people realize how fear-oriented it is. There's all these people in, in Wall Street who think that they are so s strong, willed, and so deserving. But if you go look at a day-to-day you know, uh, the day-to-day -day life is constant fear. You're, you're, you're afraid if, if, uh, if, you're, if you're playing the wrong music when you uh, drive into the parking garage. Literally. You know, yeah, it is so, there's so much fear. It's such a hierarchy and such a pecking order, especially in the, in the investment banking world. What I did is the scariest thing and, and manageable to them, right? The idea of uh, being in financial distress, the idea of having your reputation sullied, being rejected, is, is their worst nightmare. Isn't there like always a rule of thumb? Don't short on the first down day or something like that? The only rule is don't be short on Tuesday. That's oh, only, yeah. 
sold the broker guy to walk his dog. <laughs> he told me that. The difficulty has not really been um, being vindicated. I mean, that, that's actually happened for the last six months. The difficulty is what is what next? Where do I go from here?